Well, good morning and welcome to another beautiful Sunday morning here in Fredericktown at the Methodist Church. We're so glad you could join us. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. I have a couple of announcements for those of you here in the sanctuary and those of us watching online as well. Uh, next week, we will be holding a noisy offering in uh, an effort to raise funds for our Fredericktown Christian Preschool. Usually, we have Preschool Sunday, and we have a ham loaf luncheon afterwards, uh, but because of COVID protocols and such still, we're still not able to do that. So in lieu of the ham loaf luncheon, they will be doing a noisy offering next week. So bring your pockets full of coins so that we can support our preschool. Uh, they're doing awesome things down there, and I can attest to that because my wife works there, and she does a fantastic job. There's a running joke in our house. I teach high school and college. She teaches preschool, and we come home from work, and we go, how do you do it? And she says the same thing to me, and it's, it's kind of funny how God puts different people in different places for different purposes, uh, but he uses us all to his glory. And I think it's an awesome opportunity uh, for ministry for our very, very youngest uh, here at the church. So bring your coins and support them. And speaking of our young folks, our Youth Sunday is going to be May 2nd. Uh, from my understanding, they're going to be doing pretty much everything uh, for the service, which is going to be awesome. Uh, I am so excited. I would have them wave at you, but they're off at a youth retreat right now, and they should be returning today. Um, so hopefully they come refreshed and on fire for the Lord as they prepare for Youth Sunday on May 2nd. We'll also be gra or rec recognizing graduates that Sunday as well. And you know what that means? That means summer is almost upon us, which is crazy to think. Uh, just yesterday was Christmas, and then here we are, warm weather and sunshine, which I'm not going to complain about, uh, but summer is upon us, which also means golf is upon us. Golf season is here. Um, I'm pretty sure that every day as I drive past Little Apple on my way home, uh, the parking lot is getting fuller and fuller and fuller every day. Uh, so June 6th is our annual golf outing here, and that is a fundraiser for our building project. So if you haven't put together a team for that yet, uh, go ahead and do so. Get a hold of the office. I believe we still have room for some teams. I have not heard an updated number yet. Uh, all I know is Janice is going to win. So that, that's, that's kind of the running theme every year. So we will we'll see how that goes. Uh, June 13th, we will have infant baptisms and dedications here at the church as well. Um, so mark that on your calendar. And if you know anyone that would like to be baptized or dedicated that Sunday, uh, please let pastor know so we can get them on the schedule as well. All right. Busy, busy, busy time at the church, which is awesome. We still have our peace meals going on Wednesdays. We still have our ignite service going on Wednesdays. We would love to have you join us uh, for those things and obviously our Sunday morning services. Now, as I'm looking in our sanctuary, I still see some empty seats. So that tells me that y'all can invite some people right? Y'all can invite some people to come to church, to join us here, uh, to come and to worship God together, which is what we are going to do here in just a second. So I would ask, if you're able this morning, why don't we stand together for the call to worship and remain standing for our opening hymn this morning. Come and let us worship. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, and we will glorify your name forever. Let us worship, let us praise, let us give thanks. And that is what we are going to do with our opening hymn this morning, O Worship the King, and we will be singing four verses. Change 
Let's pray. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend, teach us your ways as we worship you today. May we continue to put on the full armor of God as we go throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you'd want to greet each other in a COVID-friendly manner... Good morning. Yes. Okay, encourage me. This is not my place in this church. I've been in, a, been in a lot of places in this church, but this is not one. Okay, I'm here because I'm thankful. My shirt says thankful and blessed. A week ago today, I was not thankful, and I didn't feel blessed. Um, Bob uh, had an obstruction of a common bile duct. Uh, which is the pathway that we get rid of our bile into our body for metabolism and, okay, you don't, too much information. Anyway, the bottom, when you get very sick when that happens, and sometimes it's stones and they pass on through. His wasn't. But anyway, a week ago, he had been transferred last, a week ago Friday, to Riverside because... There wasn't a doctor up here that could handle his problem. And that was a big blessing. And um, so in the process of waiting Saturday and Sunday, because nothing could be done until Monday, um, God worked. God just worked because um, we didn't know what we were in for. Um, I asked through Robin for prayers for Monday. Um, but in the process, now Bob has a deep faith, but he's, he's not comfortable expressing it, but he, he does it in other ways. And Bob's world is about high school athletics. 52 years to, for me to figure that one out, no. Anyway, bottom line is, this is not a coincidence. If, any, if a Christian ever says the word coincidence, they're foolish. That's because when you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you, and he has more power and more wisdom than you can ever believe. In the course of those, that Saturday and Sunday, people kept coming into Bob's surroundings, and, and it's amazing because a lot of times it was when I wasn't there, I was there all daytime, the night nurse <clears throat> was uh, he, I got the night nurse, one of the night nurses, um, see, he's not about talking about me, myself, my pain. He didn't have any pain, but he didn't feel good. It's about, uh, well, where are you from? And where everybody came in, well, where are you from? So one of the night nurses was from Minster, Ohio. That's three miles down the road from where Doug and Tara live, Doug, our son Doug, and Tara, and their four kids. And Minster is one of the enemy's uh, competitors with Marion Locals Athletics, Bob's whole world almost, except for the Freddies Athletics. Okay, bottom line is, they spent some time that night that they met talking about the sports. 
And so when I was there one day, a over six foot tall young woman, 30s, walked in with some younger people behind her and um, introduced herself. And Bob says, did you play basketball? She's a doctor. Did you play basketball? And she says, well, yes, I did. I was on the championship team at DeSalle High School, DeSales High School in Columbus. Okay. So they had conversation. So another time, one night, he was talking to somebody. Again, it was a female. And they got to talking, and um, he said, did you play sports in high school? And she said, yeah. And she says, I was a swimmer. And he said, what school did you go to? Pickerington. We were good. And he acknowledged that. And uh, so, so there, he was talking about Doug's kids who are on the swimming team over at Marion Local. So again, and, and before the conversation was over, he, t he had told her that we were in Destin before he got sick and that there's a great donut shop there that if she, if she ever goes to Destin and she says, well, in two weeks, me and my friends are going to Destin. And so she writes it down in her phone. The bottom, and then, okay, and then where's Gary Campbell at? So last Sunday, a chaplain came in from Riverside and she wanted to know where we were from, Knox County, Mount Vernon, Fredericktown. And she says, oh, I've been to Syker Camp. Oh yeah, we, I, I know Gary Campbell. My parents took me to that camp meeting when I was seven months old and then again and again and again. He probably doesn't know me because I've never had conversation with him, but she knew about you. So do you see what God was doing? God was bringing down Bob's anxiety level with every person that walked in that door and could talk to him about something that his whole world's about and he can relate to. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. So finally Monday came and um, I'm waiting and, and he, nobody, we knew he was going to have a procedure to try to put a stent in this blocked duct so, he, so the bile could get out of his body because he was just, he's just yellow, plainly. Anyway, um, and he, I was told it would take an hour for the procedure, and it would probably be two hours before he got in. And he left at 11, and it was 5.30, and nobody knew anything. And, and I was there, and... Um, I got a, I got a uh, text from one of my sisters in Christ. You all know her, and you know she, she prays hard. And I said, uh, she said, how are you doing? And I said, Satan's messing with my mind. And she started praying. And when she was done, Satan was not anywhere about. The name of Jesus Christ you don't have to say it once, but she said it lots of times in the prayer, and Satan was gone and never came back. So then we finally got home on Wednesday, and Thursday I was uh, melting down, as Doc would, Elder would say. Um, he was home. He was safe. Uh, Tuesday we go back and find out about the surgery, and I was just melting down because I had read over the discharge summary, and there was something in there that just frightened me. And so, so I texted one of my sister, sisters in Christ and told her I need prayer. And so I went out and got on the path and started listening and she started praying. And I haven't felt that bad since. So I want to tell you, you have a responsibility. If you're a Christian and you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you expect to go into heaven with him. He's going to ask you what he did, what you did for him. And you better be able to say that I prayed with this person when they needed it. I did this for this person. I gave somebody a cup of water. I visited somebody in jail. I made peace meals. I helped with the youth group. You better have a list or you're going to feel awful bad. And that's all I'm going to say. Praise be to God. 
Stick around. I didn't stay, say I would stay. <laughs> Uh, Bob's got some, uh, some things going forward that they're going to have to look at and are going to have to take care of. I think it's appropriate. Church, uh, those of you that would, if you'd come up and gather around Diana, and we're going to pray for Bob going forward. And those of you who, who are not comfortable coming forward, if you just extend your hand toward Diana on behalf of Bob. We're going to pray for our brother. <clears throat> And the rest of you, as I said, just extend your hand toward Diana. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our sister Diana, Lord, and her faith. And we thank you for our brother Bob and his faith. And we thank you that you are, that he is in your care and in your keeping. Both of them are. Thank you for sustaining them and leading them through the past difficult uh, week or two, Lord. And Heavenly Father, uh, I just praise you for the uh, testimony that we heard this morning. Lord, going for, forward, I know uh, Bob has uh, some uh, other medical issues, Lord, that are going to have to be dealt with. And Lord, we are just trusting you right now that as you have brought them through thus far, you will take them uh, safely the rest of the way. So Lord, fill them with your peace, with your assurance. Give the doctors and nurses uh, guidance and skill beyond themselves. And Lord, we just look forward to um, not too long, not too much further down the road, um, hearing another praise uh, from the Partingtons, how you have blessed them and sustained them and seen them through. So, Lord, we lift up Bob this morning to you. Thank you for him. Thank you for your sustaining grace upon him. And, Lord, we, we pray your healing hand continue to be upon him. And we will thank you and praise you, as has already been done this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> Our prayer hymn this morning is Depth of Mercy. Again, in this service, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. We've gathered, O oh God, to praise your matchless name and also to offer to you ourselves as your servants and the benefactors of your grace. We have gathered also to pray, to acknowledge our total dependence upon your goodness. And so we approach once again your throne of grace and we come through him who is the way, the truth, and the life, our good shepherd 
the one who leads us on right paths, the one who takes us on the true way to true life. We thank you for his word that the truth will make us free. And we thank you for his prayer on our behalf and on behalf of all believers that by your truth you will make us your holy people. Oh God, we live in a time like that of the great prophet Jeremiah when truth seems to have disappeared. We look to media. We look to the great universities of our country and our world. We look to our leaders in this nation and the leaders of the world and realize that we cannot always tell what is true And we also know that many do not even believe that there is such a thing as truth. Oh God, grant to us a revival of truth telling and give to us discernment so that we may know when we hear truth and when we do not. Because without your truth, O oh God, your people perish. So we pray even today in this service that somehow you will dig out our ears so that we might hear the truth, the truth of your word in the Holy Scriptures, the tr truth of your word as it is proclaimed by our pastor, the truth about you, O oh God, and the truth about ourselves. And when we hear it and know that we've heard it, also help us to obey it and make us valiant for truth. We pray these things in the name of him who is, again, the way, the truth, and the life. And in his name we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Long, long ago, back before we even knew about the coronavirus, our finance committee hosted some meetings where church members had the opportunity to ask questions about church finances and could also make suggestions about church finances. In more than one of those meetings, it was suggested that the congregation needed to be made more aware of the financial state of our church. Plans were underway to make that happen, and then, well, you know, things changed. The world as we knew it seemingly got put on hold. Because things were so unusual, even planning a yearly budget was hard and got delayed until just recently. But the budget has been set, it's been approved by the administrative board, and things are beginning to take up business as usual. Each month, I hope to honor the request of the people and give a report of how things are going financially at FUMC. We also hope to include it in the weekly half sheet so that you don't have to take notes. For the month of March, our offerings for the operating funds of our church totaled $34,238. Operating funds include everything that happens in the church. Salaries, utilities, ministries, supplies in the church building, and the parsonage maintenance. This is less than what was given in January, but it was an increase from February. But this number is also less than our much monthly budgeted amount of $40,000. Now that doesn't mean that we spent $40,000 in the month of March, but it is under what was budgeted. In a nutshell, even though offerings for the operating expenses for the month of March were under budget from what we had approved. For the building fund, we've collected $39,364 since January. This seems like a large number, and it is, but it's important to realize that our monthly our three-month mortgage is $43,500. $43, the majority of the money was collected from families who had made a pledge, but some was given from families who had not. Now, I don't enjoy this. I would rather come to you with numbers that are greater. I would rather give a testimony like Diana or tell you about the Jackson Area Ministry Seed Campaign. But these numbers were requested, and it's important to be transparent. What you choose to do with this information is completely between you, your family, and God. And like I said, if you need a recap, they can be found on your half sheet, which is located in the narthex. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> I just have a half a half of a single verse that I want to share with you today. And uh, Pastor Gary and I did not coordinate the, the pastoral prayer and the sermon, but my goodness, in his pastoral prayer today, he stole my thunder. <laughs> preached what I, he's prayed what I'm going to be preaching about and better than I ever could. So I thank him for his prayer uh, as always. Uh, we're going to look at another component today of the whole armor uh, of God. And uh, the uh, scripture today comes from Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians 6.14. And as I said, it's just a single, basically a half verse. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And may the Lord add understanding to the reading of his word this morning. Each year, I, I usually hear about this at the, at the end of the year, and they, they, they come out with this, but each year the Oxford English Dictionary lists its word of the year. The winners are words that have come into prominence in the past year. Recent words in 2005, the word was podcast, podcast. In 2007, now I didn't know what this word meant until I, I had to look it up, okay? Any of you know what this word means? Locavore. Any of you know what locavore means? I didn't either. It means you prefer to eat food grown locally. 
That's well, it's simple enough. Uh, in 2009, the word they chose was unfriend, which I see for some reason on my, on my Facebook account a lot. I don't know why, but, I, uh, but I, now I know what it means. It means taking someone out of your social media account. In 2013, the word was selfie. And in 2016, this is the word I want to look at. The word was post-truth. Post-truth. Truth. Some say we are living in a post truth culture. In such a culture, emotions rule and facts are optional. If you look at your social media very, very often, that is an accurate description. Emotion rules, facts are optional. When the Washington Post did an article on that word of the year, they declared in that article that truth was dead. Just in the past couple of weeks, I heard one of the leading news people in the country say that it is no longer necessary to present both sides of an issue and that fairness is overrated. And that's a quote. So is truth, is truth really dead? Well, not according to God's word. The words true and truth appear more than 250 times in the Bible. And here's what Jesus himself said about truth from John chapter 8. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus declared that truth is real, and that should be enough for us. Jesus also declared that truth is alive. Why? Because he is alive. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. He identified himself. He identified himself as truth. He said this, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, he said, listens to my voice. So you see the way to fight untruth, the way to fight Quite frankly, lies, the way to fight deception, is to listen to Jesus. And as Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and by the way, he has insight into what is going on in the Ephesian church because he was the one who went to Ephesus and started the church. And he knew that it was the center of all kinds of cults, that city. And so he is instructing them in the midst of all of this how they can grow in the faith how to equip themselves to grow in faith, and to walk in truth. Now, as we mentioned a week or so ago, Paul is writing this from a Roman jail. He looks outside his cell. He sees the guard, the the soldiers going by his cell door. And he begins by the Holy Spirit to draw parallels between the garb of the soldier and how God equips us. And so he is describing how God outfits the Christian for spiritual warfare. And you might expect he would start his list with a more obvious piece of equipment, such as the helmet of salvation or the breastplate of righteousness, but he does not. He starts his list with the belt of truth. And he starts that because the most important place The most important place when it comes to truth and spiritual warfare is our minds. Our minds. The Bible says as a person thinks, so they are. How you think, how you think is the engine that starts how we act. I think I've told you this story before, but... You know, I've been here six years now, and I'm running out of stories that I'm leaving in a couple months, so, you know, you just, just, just grin and bear it, okay? <clears throat> when Janice and I got married, <clears throat> I told myself, leading up to that day, I told myself, and it was important to me, that I appear, appear, calm and collected during the ceremony. <laughs> I, uh, I had been through so many wedding ceremonies. I had seen so many things happen. I have seen 
members of the marriage party go splat right in the middle of the service. I mean, they just fainted dead away. I have seen so many different things. And so I made up my mind. Okay, I am going to appear calm, cool, and collected. No matter how I feel, nobody's going to be able to see it. I'm going to be Mr. Cool. And so uh, really that whole day, most of the ceremony are a blur to me. But I really wasn't all that calm and collected. And uh, I believe we made it through the ceremony. No big blunders and everything went well. And then our photographer, our wedding photographer, we had a very small wedding. Only about 30 of our closest friends were there. And a a good friend of ours married us. And I made it through. My objective was achieved. I appeared calm, cool, and collected. And... Our photographer, who is a, just a, a wonderful lady, a dear friend of ours, she came up to me afterwards and she said, you were really nervous, weren't you? I said, really? Could you tell? I don't think so. She said, yeah, yeah, I could tell. And, and as she was taking pictures, she noticed that <clears throat> in my calm preparation, I had forgot to put on a belt. <clears throat> I went through my wedding ceremony without any belt on whatsoever. And when she was taking pictures, she noticed that. And I thought, well, you know, I'm in my suit jacket and, you know, nobody will be able to tell. I had all kinds of people coming up to the, after me after the ceremony. Why don't you have your belt on? You, you were really nervous, weren't you? So, yeah, yeah, I, re- I really was. <clears throat> when we think of a belt, we think of a little strip of leather or fabric that holds your pants up. But for the Roman soldier, that wasn't what they meant when they were talking about a belt. It was closer to what we would call a girdle. It protected the entire middle section of your body. And as that part of the body processes the food we eat, so it is that Paul is referring to here, that part of us that processes information and discerns truth. I I do want you, I want you to participate in this part of it, okay? How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have ever been lied to? How many of you have ever been lied to? Those few of you who are not holding up your hands are lying, okay? You're lying. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been lied to and you did not discover the truth for a long time? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Do you know what the Bible calls that? Do you know what the Bible calls that state you were in? You were in a state of deception. You were in a state of of being deceived. Do you know that we live differently when we live under a lie than when we live under the truth? Truth is important because the devil's most effective weapon is deception. The Bible says that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. That is his native language. Jesus said, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. The truth he brings us is what sets us free. When the devil lies to us and we believe that lie, and oh, how I am seeing this so much today, so much. And as Gary said in his, Pastor Campbell said in his prayer, the the places where you used to be able to look to see truth and to hear truth are no longer They're no longer giving truth, but they're giving a spin on the truth. But when the devil lies to us and we believe that lie, that starts us down a path that the Lord does not want us to take. When the devil deceives us and we act on that information and we act wrongly, that's what happened at the Garden of Eden. That's what's been happening ever since. The devil's ultimate goal of lies and deceptions is to get us to disobey God and drive a wedge between the Lord and ourselves. What are some of the lies that the devil tries to convince us of? We could have all the paper in the world and there wouldn't be enough room to talk about all the lies that the devil tries to instill in us. But let me share just a few. The devil tries to convince us that there is no hell. And because, and think about the the implications of that. If there is no hell, then I don't have to worry about um, 
the implications of my sin. I can treat you any way I, ch- I want to treat you. I can disregard you. I can disregard your feelings. I can use you. I don't have to be concerned about you in that way. And there will be no eternal consequences if there is no hell. The devil tries to convince us that there is no hurry. There's no hurry. I don't have to right now make a decision for Christ. No, I can do it like a minute before I die. And as long as I do it then, then I'm covered and I'm clear. I don't have to worry about doing it right now. And there's no hurry in regard to uh, sharing the truth of the gospel. I don't have to worry about that. No, no, no. The devil also tries to convince us that there is no hope. There is no hope. Particularly when we are discouraged, you oftentimes hear that little voice saying, what, what is the use? What is the point of trying? You may as well just kick back and give in. That's the voice of Satan. The devil also tries to tell us, and I've encountered this more in my ministry than I was anticipating through the years, but the devil also tries to tell us that there are many ways to God. There are many ways to God, and there are no absolutes. There is no absolute right and wrong. Let me tell you, every person in heaven, we will take our individual personalities with us into heaven. There will still be, um, if you will, differences in heaven between us. Nothing that will cause us to be uh, less than, than brothers and sisters in Christ, but there were, we will still maintain our individual personalities, and so there will be differences among us, but all of us in heaven will have one thing in common, and that is we were saved through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. That was true <laughs> That was true 2,000 years ago, and it will be true until Christ himself returns. There is no other way to heaven except through Christ. So much of my work and so much of the church's work is wrapped up in fighting lies and deception. And we are to fight that through the proclaiming of the truth of the word. So I want to outline three brief points as to why truth, the proclamation of truth, and the living out of truth is so important today. First, the church is God's divinely ordained method of communicating His truth. God could have communicated His truth to us in any way He wanted, but He chose to do it through His church. And if the church sounds too nebulous and too general to you, let me just say this. God chose to communicate His truth through you. God chooses to communicate His truth through you. Listen to Ephesians chapter 3. The intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is our responsibility to proclaim and live out the truth. Almost 20 years ago, this is this is a 20-year-old survey, and think this has only gotten worse in the interim period. A survey was done of ministers and their beliefs. About half the ministers did not believe that God is the all-powerful creator of the universe. Half. Half of the ministers um, did not believe that Jesus Christ never sinned. Half of the ministers did not believe that salvation is received only through Christ. Half of the ministers believed that salvation is achieved through good works. Half of the, of the um, ministers uh, did not believe that believers have a responsibility to share the gospel and that the Bible is the word of God. And those low percentages, you see the result of that in our churches and in our society today. I will never forget, starting out as a minister, I was in an extremely rural part of the state a few miles from the nearest village, a village about the size of Fredericktown, but I was a few miles further out, um, really out in a rural area. And, but in that village that we were near, in the center of town, was a church that was doing well. And they got a new minister. And Christmas came around. And so Christmas services, which are always a high point in the church calendar, Christmas services came around. And on Christmas Eve... 
On Christmas Eve, when you would want to talk about the majesty and the condescension of God as God came here in the form of a baby, you would want to talk something along that vein. On Christmas Eve, the new minister chose that, that time to deny the virgin birth. And immediately, I'm talking immediately, the church just cratered. The church just cratered because the truth was not being proclaimed and it was not being lived out, which is the entire purpose of the church. And Paul wanted to remind the Ephesian church of that. He wanted to remind them of their purpose. And in the midst of everything that is going on, but if there wasn't anything overtly going on, and if this was, if this was just an absolutely normal time in the life of the church, the purpose remains the same. And that is to proclaim and live out the truth of Jesus Christ. A second reason why truth is so important is that truth is the basis. Truth is the basis for church unity. Another scripture from Ephesians chapter 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of faith. Paul is talking about the church here and the gifts that exist in the church. There is no way there will ever be true unity in the church until we agree on common truth. Common truth that will unite us on the big things, on minor things. I really, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I could really care less what color this carpet is. I don't care. It does not matter to me. Do you know when I was a youth at my home church, we had a big, a big argument. We had a big argument. It really kind of divided the church over what? The color of the carpet. The color of the carpet. And I'm thinking as I, I don't know what I was, 14 or 15 year old, I'm thinking, who cares? Who cares? I don't care. You see, there are some things that are not worth fighting about. But there are some things that must be stood for. And the truth and the basic tenets of the faith, we must have common agreement. We must have common agreement on the truth and the truth of what God's word says. There was a young college girl and she was required to read a book that she found to be extremely boring. Just slogging through this textbook was a thing that was difficult, but she forced herself because it was required in her class. Well, a few years later, she had graduated and she was working in her field of study, and she met a young professor, and she fell in love with him. And they became engaged to be married. And one evening while visiting her home, the professor was um, kind of looking at her bookshelf. And there the professor saw this boring book tucked away, collecting dust on her bookshelf. Pulling the book down, he informed his fiancée that he had written that book under an assumed name. Later that night, the young woman began to read the book again. All night long she read that book. To her, it was the most interesting book she'd ever read. What made the difference? Now she knew and she loved the author. When we learn... When we learn to treasure this because we love the author, then we're on our way to taking in the truth. Folks, there are sections in here that are difficult to discern. And you might even have the fleeting thought, why is this in here? <laughs> there, are, there are things in here that, that are not always easy to digest. And I understand that sometimes... Reading God's word can almost seem sometimes like you do it out of duty rather than out of love. But if this were a love letter from your spouse or your intended or whatever, you would sit down and you would go through it and you would look through every word and you would think, now I wonder what they meant when they said this. 
And I wonder what the nuance of this word means. You see, when we love the author, reading and looking at the words of that author that we love, of the one that we love, it's no, it's no job. It's a delight. The third reason that we are, that truth is so important is that true worship of God requires truth. When Jesus was talking with the woman at the well, he said, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Everything that we do here, and I think we do an exceptional job here, everything we do here in terms of worship must be centered on the truth of who God is and what God has done. It needs to be continually emphasized because that kind of true worship is what differentiates our gathering from other kinds of, of, uh, of gatherings. I still remember, again, a story you've heard in Israel. And I'm standing beside the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. They didn't normally let the part that we were in, the um, uh, Muslims didn't ordinarily let folks into. And we're there, and we're taking a little tour, and inside their temple there, they have a madrasa, which is a school. And in this case, it was a preschool. And the kids, they came marching out in single file as we're outside looking. And it reminded me of our preschool. Just beautiful, beautiful children. Wonderful smiles. And they looked at us, smiling. And as they're passing by us, they begin to sing. And they begin to sing and smile as they're looking at us. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of our own preschool. We had a preschool at previous church. And, and I, I'm thinking of that and how, how beautiful these children are. And I'm smiling. And, and I don't understand Arabic. I don't, I don't know what Arabic is or I don't speak Arabic. But the pastor standing next to me did, and he went, you know what they're singing? <laughs> you know what they're singing? I said, no, no, what are, what are they singing? And in so many words, he said, they're singing that they're going to kill us. They're singing that they're going to kill us. As they pass by, they're looking at us and smiling, and they're singing that they're going to kill us. Folks, there is one true kind of true worship, and that is worship of Jesus Christ. Nothing else, nothing else, only worship of Jesus Christ qualifies what the Bible calls worship. Always keep that in mind going forward. Our worship must be centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ. On Easter, we spoke of how each of us have, a, have to have a personal experience with the Lord until before our faith becomes alive. In a similar way, each of us has to put on the belt of truth for ourselves. We have to put on the belt of truth for ourselves. You have to put on your own belt. No one's going to do it for you. You have to put on your own belt. When Jesus and Pilate had a brief discussion just before Jesus was turned over to be crucified, Jesus said to Pilate, For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And you remember what Pilate said? What is truth? What is truth? And I still stagger when I look at that because Pilate was staring truth in the face. He was staring the embodiment of truth in the face. And he said, what is truth? He didn't recognize it. The way that the armor of God is described in Ephesians, it makes clear each of us has to put it on ourselves. It's not something my mom or my dad will put on for me. No, each of us has to make the decision ourselves to put on that truth, the truth of God. To be fruitful Christians... 
to stand strong against many of the tides of the culture today. We need to know the truth. We need to practice the truth. And as Jesus said, the truth will set us free. In today's world, oh, especially in today's world, we have to intentionally make the effort to know and to live out the truth. We are bombarded with falsehood from every corner of society. And unless we are intentional about it, falsehood will seep in and we will become deceived. As Christians, we are commanded to walk in the freedom of God's truth. And as we do that and let the light of God's truth shine through us, our lives will truly honor Him and will make an eternal difference. We are commanded, walk in the truth, the truth of God's Word. Let this be your filter. Saturate yourself with God's Word and the truth of God's Word. Our, our opinions, our stance, if you will, is not to be based on feelings. It's not to be based on other people's opinions. Our standard, our stance is to be based on God's word, what God has done and said. We are called to do that. We are commanded to do that, to know and to live out the truth of God's word. And then we will truly be free and effective and fruitful Christians. Today I really don't have, kind of unusual, but I really don't have a specific altar call today. I would simply say, commit yourself to walk in the truth of God's Word. You cannot walk in the truth of what you do not know. Saturate yourself with His Word and then obey what it tells you to do. And as you do that, you will find that you are making an eternal Eternal difference. Even though we have no specific altar call today, the altar is open and the invitation is given. And I encourage you, let this inform your opinion on what is going on. Let this be your standard and your guide. Commit your way to God and His Word and His leading. And as you do, you will walk in freedom. The altar is open and the invitation given today. Let us stand together for our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation. We will be singing verses 1, 2, and 5. Excellent word. 
let us commit ourselves as individual Christians and as a church. We will stand on the truth. Stand on the truth of God's Word and proclaim, unashamedly proclaim the truth of God's Word. And then we can always be assured God is with us and we need not be afraid. Lord, whether you return tomorrow or whether you return a thousand years from tomorrow, when you return, may you find this church and the people of this church standing on your truth and proclaiming your word. We give you thanks and we give you praise today. In Jesus' name, amen.